And welcome to Fire Headlines, where we discuss the hottest fire news to hit within the last two weeks. I'm your host, Inanna Hanke, and I'm joined today by the panel, Chief Bob Horton and Chief Jeff Buchanan. It is that time of year again. Fire season is upon us, and I imagine that we are going to have a lot to talk about regarding wildfire as the summer rolls on. But our wildfire topic today is liability. Who is responsible for the damages caused by a fire? two examples to discuss today, the first of which is that the state of California wants parents to pay for a fire that their kids started. The Skyline 3 fire near San Diego, California burned 100 acres in June of 2020 over the course of three days. The fire was started by young kids who were playing with a campfire. The state now wants the parents to pay over $675,000 for the cost of fighting the fire and the damages that it caused. Now, this wasn't an isolated incident. The lawsuit alleges that one or more of the kids actually started another fire three days prior with sticks that were used with the family's campfire. I remember not playing with matches and keeping sticks in the fire being two of Maybe the most early hazard mitigation lessons I received as a child. It seems fair to me that if we can pin a destructive fire on someone, if we know who started it, then they should be responsible for it. And if it's children, ultimately the parents or guardians are responsible. But Bob, how do you feel about this story? There's a lot of complexity as it pertains to wildfire, and we do live in a, in a society where we have to find a, a space, right? So there has to be a finger pointed somewhere and there has to be a blame. It, you know, there's a sense of accountability and accountability. We talk about accountability on this on our show a lot because this is a big, a big part. There are there are many contributing factors that go into a wildfire. It's a very complex phenomenon. You know, it, it, it arguably is the only disaster category that has a man-made human-caused component to it. About 70% of wildfires, give or take, are human-caused fires versus 30% are nature-caused by lightning strikes, for example. Lightning strikes are responsible for causing a lot of a lot of wildfires, but 70% of the wildfires we're seeing are human caused. Somebody is directly responsible for contributing to the start of the fire. Now, the 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 growth and the spread of the fire, there are other contributing variables. So it's where now you have this human caused interface with an environmental disaster that or environmental conditions that creates, you know, ultimately this wildfire. I agree with your sentiment and honor that where there is accountability, folks should be held accountable. However, I do think we need to really look at accountability in this broader spectrum of who has a responsibility for reducing risk overall to these contributing factors of wildfire and not necessarily specific to this this California case where we're going to talk about another one that that was a contributing factor of a, a utility company in Oregon. Everybody who lives in a wildfire prone region has the has a responsibility or, or, or some contributing factor to reducing overall wildfire risk. So in this case, yeah, the fire was started by by kids. Kids should be or, or whomever it is that starts. If there's evidence that supports the fact that they, in fact, caused that fire, they should be held. They should be held accountable. I got to play the other side of this thing. I was really, really compromised when I when I read this. I, I got to tell you, I'm gonna, I, 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 I don't disagree. I don't disagree with the accountability piece, but, you know, a strong sense of where I'm coming from, Bob, I think leans into what you're talking about is reducing the risk of the situation ever happening in the first place. And then Okay, I get the accountability to to an extent, but we're talking about children here and they, the descriptor in the article is young. They didn't say how old they are. And I'm like, okay, crushing the family with six hundred and seventy five thousand dollars of a fine that nobody, no normal person could possibly withstand. It will send them into bankruptcy if it follows them. It could potentially hinder them for the rest of their lives. Right. I'm really struggling with it. And I, I, I read the article. These, you know, we're, we're painting a picture of poor parenting and uh, use that are out of hand, out of control. 
Um, and I, I guess for me, it seems like if we're ultimately going to produce children that will hopefully turn out to be better contributing members to society as adults is finding their parents this huge amount of money is that is that going to achieve that goal so i really it was hard for me personally to get away from that from that kind of parent perspective to be to be quite honest with you and it may sound like i'm shirking the the blame and and uh and i hear what you're you're both saying but i really i really really struggled with this one a whole heck of a lot and um but to me what is what it points to is the complexities of the wildfire situation i do not to give in to hyperbole, but to some extent, I think it is just a way, way, way more sophisticated issue than structure fires. And there's so much more that's, that's going into this. And there isn't a one size fits all. It's a right sizing for every single situation. And uh, I guess this is where I become lame sauce. I don't know what the answer is here. I just, I'm not feeling, I'm just not feeling good about $675,000 fine to two parents over children and and really what that does, you know, moving forward. So I, I really struggled with this one, you two. I, I really did. I think that, you know, and Jeff brings up a fair point and because it's a larger discussion about that I'm not qualified to opine on. And that's to what extent are parents responsible for the actions of their kids. And, and it does, I, I, I think it matters uh, uh, on how old they are uh, when it, when it relates to what responsibility kids take versus parents take. So I, so I don't know. I, so I, I mean, I guess, I, I guess you bring some, you know, you bring some good light to this particular element of, of the story. There's a clear responsibility to the kids, you know, for starting this fire and what accountability looks like in either the juvenile justice lens. And this is a, the, the money being paid, I assume would be a civil liability. Uh, be curious how the courts land on that. This is not the first time that, kids have started wildfires that there's a cost. So in fact, that happened in Oregon. If you, if you recall and on up near your, your neck of the woods, just outside or just in Portland, a fairly, fairly large fire that was started by juveniles and and illegal fireworks uh, where we want to point the responsibility. Right. And does the, does the amount of money matter? Should it matter? Is it 675,000 or is it $15 million in, in, in damage? In fact, $600,000 in fire wildfire suppression costs is pretty cheap. They got out pretty cheap uh, in terms of what it really costs to suppress and the impact to those fires, not to mention trickle down of effect of when those resources are deployed. That means they're they're not available to be deployed to other fires that may have needed them at that at that same time, which is not which is not factored into that number. So I, uh, Jeff brings up a good point. Uh, the question really then becomes, uh, I'll ask Jeff is, you know, where does accountability lie? Uh, maybe it's not a financial hit to the parents. Where do you see accountability in a, an event like that? Well, I, you know, again, I'm focusing back on, you know, I, I really do think a lot and we talk about a lot on the show, talk about psychological, emotional, behavioral health of, of, of firefighters. We're talking about people here in general. And I think about, you know, those children. So and maybe it wasn't recorded in the story, fairness to, to the author and the journalist. But what I didn't see in the story is the, you know, the fire setters class that the, the children are going to be exposed to the the education, the, you know, kind of the rehabilitation and the retraining that clearly needs to for the parents, too, because obviously they're not paying attention as close as they should to the dangers of of wildfires. But I think that that was the starting space that I didn't see that really I, I really got super disconnected from and, you know, and overly concerned is that I didn't see that at all. All I saw was the fine to the parents and, you know, all of this focus going on to the parents for for their for their accountability over over their kids. And I probably got hung up on the wrong part of the story. And maybe that's the human element that we all bring to this. I'm thinking, gosh, darn it. If I'm the parent, I'd, I'd like to think that wouldn't happen. I'd like to really, really stamp that. But then on the other hand of me, I, I sit back in this, I'm going to be curious and not judge, give a little, little shout out to uh, Ted Lasso fans out there. But, uh, it, you know, and that, that really, 
that really gives me a moment of pause. I'm like, shoot, what are the other, what else don't I know about this one? What else don't we all know about this one? So it's, uh, I love talking about it because I think that it, it just adds this complexity and this dimension that we're just not normally talking about, you know, except for you bringing a, a parallel story, it sounds like, that happened that happened recently. Um, but there's just so many factors here. And, um, and a lot of times we concentrate on these negative impacts, rightfully so, to all of the, the lives that were lost, the families that were impacted by these wildfires, the properties that were lost. And again, rightfully so. In a case like this, there's potentially, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, it sounds like there's two kids, two parents, there's four people, there's four other people here that could be potentially devastated for life, for life with irreparable, damages you know to their psyche and potentially their their financial situations so what what it really really points out for for me and really really underpins is that wildfires particularly are it's a nationwide everybody's got to pay attention problem and i think that up until the last couple of years it has only felt like it was a problem in certain geographical areas in the United States. And it's, it, it only has to do with wildfire firefighters, wildland firefighters. And, and to me, this is another example of how it just, it impacts everybody. And I, I'm appreciative of the U S fire administration. And of course, all the work that the Western is doing and all these fantastic partnerships to, to try to tackle this this issue. And so, uh, yeah, that's my major takeaway there is that, you know, this problem is so huge. It, 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 we need everybody involved and it's just impacting everybody. And unfortunately, it's impacting too, pe- too many people negatively. I really appreciate your compassionate approach, Jeff. And I'm just wondering... I suppose as fire chiefs, I would hope that maybe you have some recommendations perhaps to how parents can talk to their kids about fire safety. That's what came to mind for me is are things are are there things that we can say to younger people that you have seen to be effective or what is maybe the general like pedagogy that you support as far as educating folks on just how dangerous these events can be? Yeah, I'll take I'll take a stab at that one. Um I think here, you know, not knowing the situation clearly in some of the details are obviously foggy with the with, with the report. You just know we're going to get all the answers. Uh, difficult to kind of pinpoint exactly what you could do, um, depending on the age of the kids, frankly. And, I, and then this kind of goes in complete retrospect or in, in complete opposite of where maybe I've been taking this conversation is don't let your kids go near the fire at all. It's okay. It's okay. They got a whole lifetime to teach them about fire and maybe tackling at a different point in time. I don't have all the answers as a parent. There's no doubt about that. And there is a balance between allowing your kids to understand certain dangerous things in life earlier than later. I'm not getting into any of that, but that could have been one of the potential answers here. Um, it could be depending again the the age of the kids is having that regular communication every time that there is fire in the house cooking is to say hey come on out with me while I'm barbecuing and 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 talk about hey this is in a barbecue it's completely contained it's safe but fire is very unsafe unless you take certain safety measures. But um, those are kind of just some need some personal things from from my standpoint. I think that it comes back to Anana, one of the biggest challenges in the fire service, and it has to do with culture and that's community risk reduction. Too many fire departments, the the fire prevention bureau, if that's what they're named, they take on community risk reduction. And there's not enough of them 
There's not enough of them. It takes the entire fire department to have a community risk reduction approach. That means the firefighters, that means the fire prevention personnel. That means everybody pushing out messaging of education and consequences to um, irresponsibility and not paying attention to the dangers of fire. So I think the, the, the best move forward is trying to help change culture in the fire service that community risk reduction is not a sexy phrase it's something that has to be front and center for all fire departments and all fire personnel all fire personnel and uh, i think that's really the only way to kind of make some more progress here which would of course include kids so um it's a bugaboo it's a bugaboo of a problem I, I like that you you brought out Jeff's compassion from this perspective. So I don't I don't have kids and Jeff and Jeff does. And that might be why we have differing opinions on uh, the level of accountability the parents probably uh, could or should have or or managing of children. He's got more experience in that space. So so it's fair that he would have more compassion as well. Uh, there is an amazing program that the U.S. Fire Administration and NFPA uh, the National Fire Protection Association endorsed, and it is it is Youth Fire Setters Education Program, and it's specifically designed to identify children. There's there's some evidence in the literature that suggests, you know, if these certain behaviors are observed at a child of anywhere from five to eighteen years old, I think I I read about th that they they are at high, that at high risk of you know contributing to some kind of bad fire event. Uh, sometime in the future. And so they're driven into this program. So while as a fire chief, I myself was not specially trained and had to manage youth who were who were starting fires or or had attributes that would hint, send them down that direction, uh, we knew where to point them to. And this program has got great evidence that shows their success in uh, diverting you know children from uh, a path towards uh, fire destruction. Uh, to one that that builds resilience with them in children. So for for listeners that are not familiar with youth fire setting program, uh, please, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Please do some research on it, because if you're working in a community, you don't have access to those kind of resources. Uh, you're you're so, sort of set up for failure. So that that's my answer as the fire chief is I'm going to we're going to drive this diversion program. We're going to drive as many children who are at risk for being fire starters into that type of a of a program and uh, really try to break that path. I guess that pathway that they're up. It's a great resource to know about. Thank you. In our next example, Oregon's second largest electrical utility, Pacific Corp, was found to have played a significant role in the Labor Day wildfires that ravaged parts of the state in 2020. The utility caused a substantial amount of damage related to the fires in the Santee M Canyon, as well as Southern Oregon and the Oregon coast. Throughout the specific case, the plaintiff's lawyers said that leaders at Pacific Corp should have known from weather reports and warnings that a major windstorm and extremely dry conditions had the potential to start an uncontrollable wildfire on Labor Day. Bob, as a fire chief, what has been your experience with utility companies? I was actually fire chief of one of these fires uh, that had contributed into our into our community. So I'm very familiar with uh, this particular this particular space. Well, at first, I'm going to take a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about from the utility company's perspective. They're they're in a real difficult position here. Now, I, I, again, I'm not, I don't want to excuse their role in con in this contribution, but I want to talk just broadly about the position public utilities are in. They generally have, uh, you know, they've got these power lines that are moving power from one area of a state to another area of a state. It's it's you know naturally going to have to go through heavily vegetated areas that they try to manage for and have been successful at it for a number of years. There's you know, with the changing climate, with the changing landscape on the ground, and of course, aging infrastructure, those are all part, part of what utilities are, are having to wrestle with. This particular, and, and, and I also want to give a plug to the Western Fire Chiefs and the work that they're doing, because that this this issue with utilities and fire starts is really at the forefront of some of the work the Western does at the intersection of wildfire policy and technology advancements. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit here um, in a second. 
But the the trade off now, like let's just talk about what we learned from the 2020 fire and where the power or the utility companies are broadly. This is this we happen to talk about Oregon, but this is occurring in all states that have wildfire, and of course they have utilities. So this is an issue. Is when there are certain factors that are contribute that that are predicted. So weather patterns that are predicted to cause an issue. So they raise the problem. We don't know with certain. We never know with certainty when when and where fires are going to start, whether it's lightning started or human caused or utility caused, we don't know. It's a, There's uncertainty. And so the fire officials and utility officials are making decisions based on probability of risk. And when the probability raises to certain levels, that is typically a trigger point for some type of a mitigative decision. So let's, these fires, for example, it was the winds. When the, the, there was high heat, and high wind, so high risk that these power lines could contribute to to some type of an issue. Today, that that risk tolerance, that threshold is now lowered to a space where the utility company will shut power off to that those power lines. So you know, if this risk reaches a certain threshold, and I don't know what it is, but if it reaches reaches a threshold, they're going to power down that that area of the grid, which is going to impact thousands of homes. They're going to lose power. Now, folks who lose power as a result of this preventative effort at the utility companies are not happy, right? They're, and, and there are trickle-down effects that are going to negatively impact households uh, up to and including really, really potentially tragic outcomes for not having power in their house. Folks who are on oxygen machines, for example, that may be dependent on power. Now, one would think there's battery backups and this kind of stuff, but you're sort you're sort of getting into elements communities need to prepare for that. If it's not wildfire disaster, it's long term power outages and starting to think differently from emergency management, because that's going to be the, the trade off. That's the trickle down effect of turning the power off to, to large swaths of people. They're really unhappy about that because that you new know, we, we really don't know how to measure the fire that doesn't start in the impact of the community. But what we can do is narrow in a little bit on the risk. Let, let me speak to something something new. So that's one policy outcome of the this type of event that pressure from policymakers to utility companies is you have to do better at, at preventing these fires, you know, these fire starts from happening. One way is shut, de- de-energize the lines when there's risk for wildfire. Another way is to upgrade the infrastructure or bury the infrastructure underground to the tunes of hundreds of millions, you know, or if not billions of dollars, depending on on where and how much you have to do. That's a that's a huge cost burden uh, to have, and that ends up getting getting recalculated and trickled down to the to the property owner level, and now you pay more for power because the power company took these. Uh, took these mitigative issues, and they, and they talk a little bit about that in the article about you know, will, will these utility companies be able to pass the cost of this this litigation down to the to the user level? And the Public Utility Commission sort of argues, no, we, we won't allow rates to increase to pass that around. That's a shell game. They'll find a way to pass rates down one way or the other. The the end user is going to pay for this. And the article just alludes to, well, maybe you're not paying for our litigation, but you're going to pay for what actions we now have to take to be more fire safe, to reduce our probability or likelihood. The third, uh, third and there may be more, but just my thinking around this, or the third uh, opportunity for power companies is upgraded and updated technology. And they have engaged in that. Many of the power companies that at least the Western Fire Chiefs are familiar with are engaging in upgraded technology to alert them that there's a problem with a particular power line. This case was weather converged. In some cases, it's just the power line fails, falls to the ground, catches catches fire. That now there are sensors that are able to de- detect these problems sooner and get get um maintenance teams out to fix that. And some of it's on the on the power line type sensors. Others are drone technology that's patrolling certain areas in uh, in high wildfire risk, you know, regions. Of course, when there's high wind and you can't fly drones, it's a different, different story. So you got you got technology solutions, you got policy solutions, and and all come with with some varying degree of trade-offs. I'm I'm wondering so, so what struck me about this article is, is actually two things. One, you did a fantastic job of outlining. It's in the story. It does touch on this decision point of powering down and impacting some of the citizenry 
and ultimately making the choice to keep the power up. But what is conspicuously not included is exactly what in the heck that means. You just alluded to oxygen machines not being available, ventilators. You and I could go down a laundry list of medicinal treatments that are on pumps and a whole host of things that could literally be life or death. Literally, people could lose their lives if they lost power. We could talk about food that's spoiled. We could go on and on and on. But, and again, the article conspicuously doesn't include that. So I think it's about some perspective. I think that, 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 I think that that's huge. Um, and, and to that end, I would like to say that I think that um, transparency might help utility companies and um and, and what i mean what, what i mean by that is if they were to discuss or openly disclose that every year that they invest x amount of money which could be compared to their total revenue and how much they invested in those three policy areas that you were talking about they might be able to explain to the people and build a little bit more trust in some transparency in the utility, which I like to call quasi-government here. I don't know if it's actually government for this particular case. So that's one facet of, of this that really struck me that I you know, that I wanted to discuss. But the other piece is there was some disappointment. And again, you just wonder if it's the way it's being reported. They do give a flavor of diabolical conspiracy and the cover-up and the non-disclosure of certain elements and you just has to wonder for me are those employees just doing what they were told did they do something accidentally or was there this fantastic cover-up that you know as the reader makes you think okay uh, that makes all the sense in the world to get that that huge type judgment. So um, ultimately, I think that it would behoove uh, actually in that case, too, it would behoove the power companies to a disclose how much money they are actually investing, which is back into the community to avoid situations like this from ever happening. So people can see and get their arms around what a reasonable investment is. That's number one. But number two, disclose your investigative policies and procedures and disclose them to the community so you can have, again, the ordinary citizen peek behind the curtain of a massive revenue generating public utility to say, okay, this seems reasonable. This is a horrible thing, but yeah. Maybe they're not so bad. And, you know, what, what does it really look like? So those are just kind of two of the things that danced around in my head as, as I was reading and kind of chewing on the article. In our last episode, we talked a bit about an incident that happened at a fire department where there was a very near miss and the the level of investigation that they put into the organization to try and figure out what had happened and how to respond. And that makes me wonder what kinds of systems utilities have in place to do the same thing? To what extent? I'm curious, I guess, about the culture within a utility company and how they approach risk management in this regard, especially when these risks are millions of dollars. I think California's PG&E just agreed to a $55 million settlement a year or two ago for the Kincaid fire and the Dixie fire. So clearly there are certainly dollars and lives at risk here. So I would be curious to know, I don't have any information about that, but what utility companies are doing on their end to close those gaps and figure out everything that contributed to these problems. Uh, you had posed a question about, you know, sort of this risk management perception perspective of the utility companies. And I would find it hard to believe there's any utility leader out there that you know, is perfectly comfortable with knowing that they would caused a wildfire or some some devastation. I, I would find that really hard to believe. However, these you know companies, organizations, even people, we all manage some element of risk. And we insure ourselves against risk. And it creates this space that economists call a moral hazard. 
and a moral hazard is a situation where what they call an economic actor, when a, a person or an organization or someone who has agency over decisions has an incentive to increase its exposure to risk because it does not bear the full costs of that risk. So we have, you know, generally speaking, people you know, may have health insurance. When you have health insurance, there's another funding source that pays for the decisions that we make that may contribute to us having a bad health outcome. It's not just the risks of say we get struck by 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 a vehicle and and now we have a medical issue. Uh, we have contributing factors to our own medical medical challenges like our our diet and, and exercise, you know, that may contribute to health conditions down the future. Better our insurance, the, the economists would predict perhaps the, the, the worst mitigative efforts or actions we may personally take. Now, let me transfer this to what we're talking about. Companies have insurance to insure them against risk. And they they may make decisions about how much risk they're willing to take based on what that insurance writer is is willing to cover for them. So I believe that we are going to see you know this policy decision or these policy actions take shape or the market react to it, meaning the insurance markets reactions to this. When the insurance companies tell the utility, we are not insuring against uh, your cause of this fire because you know I imagine a healthy chunk of this settlement, uh, or liability is going to be paid out through an insurance policy. It's not just sort of coming out of the pocket of the CEO. An insurance policy, policy is going to pay for that. And then it's going to be be tucked into a future uh, rate increase to that particular company. But until the insurance companies, and we're seeing it at the household level, we're seeing insurance companies, and we'll probably have some articles to talk about this uh, in the future, Insurance markets are reacting to the risk and in many cases are either transferring it by exorbitant rate increases to property owners in the wildland urban interface, or in worst cases, they're just not insuring people at all. And that's starting to drive, it appears to start to drive more action by the household to say, all right, I need to, I need to do something about this because my investments are at risk and I can't back that risk with some level of insurance. And I suspect the same thing's going to happen with utility companies that insurers and secondary insurance markets are putting pressure on these utilities to say, you have to lower this risk. And while I agree with Jeff that, that public trust is really important. So they should be transparent about the actions they're, they're they're doing. I am confident in that these utility companies are having that discussion with their insurance policyholders and having to demonstrate what they are doing with available technology and available resources to lower their risk because uh, it's going to impact their future rates. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. It's great to talk about whether you are an individual homeowner or a large utility, the threat of wildfire is something that we all have to contend with these days. So just a reminder to all of you out there that this is a, a common issue and the more folks we have thinking about it and working on it, the better off we are all going to be going forward. If you have a question for the panel, please reach out to us at fireheadlines at wfca.com and let us know what's on your mind. And we'll see you back here next week for more Fire Headlines. Thank you.